Hello, everyone. And today, my name is Linda Anticoli. I'm a research scientist at Cambridge Quantum Computing and a teaching fellow, which is equivalent to a lecturer at the University College of London. I do teach computer science and I am a computer scientist. And uh, today I will tell you my story from a small town to the quantum world. Um, this is a rather untechnical um, talk, so forgive me if there are no many technicalities. It's much more something as my, my path, what brought me to the quantum domain, and what should we do to keep people... Hey, hey, Linda, I just wanted to say hello, and can we give just two minutes to let people join, but it's so good to yes, see you. Please. Yes, hi Denise, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me, actually. Oh, sure. Uh, just wanna give everybody a minute to join. Sure. Um, I don't know if you saw the last talk, but Orly was part of the French Navy, which was amazing. And I know you have an equally amazing story to tell us, so thank you. Um, Hopefully mine will be amazing. Surely not as amazing as a Navy story, of course. So, okay, why don't we get started now? And I'll be joining back at the end. I'm gonna ask for the mic, and if you see a mic request, give it to me uh, so we can have questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Okay, so we can start, hopefully. Okay. This is my story from a small town to the quantum world. It started with my childhood. And it started when I was considering computer science as my university major, and my mom looked dubious. You are a girl, won't you prefer something else, uh, maybe literature? I didn't. I just finished a grammar school. Uh, you know, in Italy, a grammar school is that school in which you study literature, Latin, Greek, philosophy, and very little math. And I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more about technology, about math, about sciences. And don't get me wrong, my mom, she wasn't just genuinely considering my natural inclination. That was small town society speaking through her. But of course, I don't assume bad intention, just a little bit of social myopia. So I graduated in computer science. We started um, as six women out of 80 people. And at the end of my master's degree, we were just two, two women out of 12 men. And it was kind of fun. This brought me, this is very short, but okay, this brings me to my academic adolescence. When I was considering a PhD, as a natural consequence of my academic path, uh, many of my mentors and even some of my friends uh, were skeptical. You're a woman with a computer science master and uh, you can find a job here in the blink of an eye. Find a proper job, told me my grandma. Of course, a mediocre job in a small town with a wage that not even a PhD student in Italy has. And believe me, it's low. Nothing to say, I was curious. So I applied for a PhD around Europe and in the UK, as we have to say now. I have been accepted in most of the places I applied, but for, you know, sentimental reason, I am human after all, my hometown won and I stayed there. I don't assume bad intentions, and my mentors or friend words, uh, not obviously in my grandma. Again, it is small town speaking through them. Small town means scarcity of jobs. You have to rush and get whatever mediocre you can find to secure your future, then probably get married and uh, please become respectable. So I, of course, decided for, the PA, for a PhD and I chose uh, quantum computing as topic. As a computer scientist, I'm not a physicist, as a computer scientist, that was an exciting new area. And you have to remember that at the time we were close to the quantum manifesto and the relapse of the, of the whole uh, quantum computing stuff. So I tried to pick an interesting topic 
which was formal verification of quantum systems. Basically, what I did was I, cre I used the logic to create a model of my quantum system, of my quantum program. Then I use another logic, which is a temporal logic, to verify properties on my quantum program. And without having to test the program just to apply some tricky graph theoretic stuff, you can decide whether your, prog your quantum program is free from errors or not. That was my PhD. My, I chose the, the topic in formal verification because my university was strong in theoretical computer science, so it was quite easy to find supervisors interested. To my initial delight, one of my supervisors was a woman. I thought it could have I could have found an ally in a traditionally male-dominated area. To my disappointment, she was more interested in me babysitting her kids than carrying out proper research. Anecdote, this is an important anecdote, and it, it's an, a very sad one. I was once asked to join my super, one of my supervisor's family on holiday. I was Super enthusiastic. You know, when you are a PhD, you feel like a duckling uh, around uh, at the mama duck, which is your supervisor. You follow your supervisor and you basically admire uh, them. Then a few days before the big day, the holiday, I was told that she was so grateful that I could join them to babysit her kids while she was hiking with her husband. I felt I didn't even know how I was a professional. Of course, I was a girl, but it was not my duty to babysit my supervisor's um, kids. And so I didn't go. You know, I need full disclosure from the beginning. Luckily, the other supervisor actually supervised me and we were able to publish some interesting jobs. Works. This and the story of my PhD. Uh, so I decided to do a postdoc and many relatives frowned. So I decided not to listen to anyone and to move abroad. I worked hard, but it wasn't easy at first. You know, my university back home uh, is quite good academically, but also quite unknown. And usually, um, at least until some time ago, some Italians believe that my hometown was in Austria. So my self-esteem, my academic self-esteem was quite low in the beginning. Then I realized that uh, I was an art worker. So I decided to quit the self-pity and rationalize. Unfortunately, there are still two main issues that people coming from small academic realities face. The first one is the imposter syndrome. Have you ever um, experienced the imposter syndrome? The imposter syndrome in, is when you apply and you get um, a, a job which is uh, way higher than you consider yourself uh, to deserve. Of course, you start thinking very bad things like, oh my God, um, I, I fault everyone. And um, even if my mentor is a genius, he might have uh, seen something in me that doesn't exist and something like that. This is also, um, this is a bad phenomenon and it might become a self-fulfilling prophecy because believing that you are an imposter conveys the idea that you are an imposter. So for all your life, you have been told that something is not for you and you start to believe it. And this harms heavily your chances to make a good impression during an interview and during your whole life. Don't get me wrong. Everyone working in science sooner or later experienced this phenomenon. And to some extent, this is good since it pushes us higher on the ladder. But when coming from minorities or small towns or small town realities, the imposter syndrome is a part of a depressing everyday life. This is the internal phenomenon that is worrying when coming from minorities and small towns reality. The other issue I noticed is more external than internal, but still heavily harms people's self-esteem and opportunities. Um, in later... 60s, yeah, I guess late 60s, uh, the psychologist Robert Merton identified a, a, a psychosocial phenomenon very common in science. He called this the Matthew effect of accumulated advantage. 
According to this effect, relatively unknown scientists or people whose alma mater is not as important as required um, get little, very, get disproportionately little credit when compared with people of equal intelligence, but coming from big institutions or having a famous name behind. This can, to some extent, be justified. We are all human beings. Our memory is limited, so we have to use clues to choose between candidates. But consider that we might be missing the nest, the cart, or Pascal. Uh, while looking to maybe mediocre, we don't know, people whose only credit is the only one of having a big institution behind. Let me try to work an example with you. We have two MIT candidates. Sam Marks, maybe valedictorians, same publications, who are gone. In, in this game, you have to pick one of the two before the interview. So you haven't had the chance to actually sample their knowledge. Who are you going to choose? OK, this is difficult. I need to add a little bit more information. The first candidate is from Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is the first world ranking university for computer science, whilst the other one is from Mississippi, which is the 800th world ranking for CS. It is still a very good university for other sciences and maybe also for CS. We don't know. Rankings are not always the best indicator. Are you still going to interview both? Don't lie. Of course, this is you know, this is us being humans. But the Matthew effect is this. Big institutions, of course, have higher reputation and attract more people, but are also very expensive and they get more fundings. More fundings means more money. More money means better labs, more research. More research means more papers, more outcomes, more articles. And this is a vicious circle. You can just turn the arrows on the other side, and that's another vicious circle. You know, MIT is also very expensive. But this didn't happen in my personal experience. I saw that happening, and I was afraid of this. My personal experience uh, is it ended well. I shot to the moon, literally. I applied for dream positions, working with famous and brilliant people, and I have been accepted. This is mostly due to the fact that the quantum community is very young, and the people composing it is welcoming and enlightened, both in academia and in industry. The first job I applied to, um, and I, I have been accepted, was uh, uh, in Cambridge Quantum Computing, and I was interviewed, I had been interviewed by, um, one of the people whose paper I was using for my PhD thesis. So I was quite, I was just uh, looking at some kind of God, academically speaking. And um, he told me, oh yes, we decided to hire you. I was over the moon and like, oh my God, but I come from Udine. I, I'm a very tiny, I'm very tiny academically. But you know, quantum computing uh, gave me the chance to, to shine. And they basically accompanied me through all my, my path. Then I decided to apply for an academic position at UCL. And uh, yes, again, both, I, you know, you have to work hard to obtain things. But once you have a big name on your shoulders, it's just easier. We want this kind of enlightened enlightenment that we have in the quantum world to last because we don't want, as I told you before, we don't want to miss the, ne the next top scientist because their institution is unknown. And of course, we don't want to regret snobbing some minority just for some kind of academic bias because we, can, we can't afford that. If we want to be inclusive, diverse and fair, we have to do more. But also if we want to be more competitive, so this is the story uh, of how quantum computing changed my life. And uh, just uh, um, as a wrap up, let's remember two main things. As women, we were the rather unknown scientists. 
And if no one would have given us the chance to shine, going against the bias that the medieval perception inevitably inscribed, we wouldn't be hosting such brilliant meetings. And maybe we should ask someone to sign our articles to have a chance to be accepted. But also, so we have to be enlightened and open-minded. And as a single person, what I advise, whether you come from a big institution or from a very tiny one, you have to work hard always. It always pays back, but also be confident. Because be also bold if needed, but working hard, being confident and being intellectually and some amount of intellectual humility always does the trick. Of course, again, we have the, as women, we have the social responsibility to be more inclusive because we weren't supposed to be included in the science domain at first. And now we are here talking about science and being professionals and top level professionals in science. So as usual, awareness of a bias is the first step to avoid it. And thanks to the quantum domain, I'm here as well. And also thank you to my colleagues and to my superiors. And uh, that's it. I hope that you liked my talk and uh, thank you again for participating. <laughs>